they get started, what to do then. So we're here to help you take that first step. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for the second panel, Gerard Vicignano. Um, so Gerard specializes in the sale of luxury and architectural homes. He's a partner with Vista Sotheby's International Realty with offices in Palos Verdes, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, Redondo Beach, and Long Beach. He's a lifelong resident of the South Bay coastal communities and has been representing extraordinary homes all over Southern California for over 30 years. His clients' homes have been featured in publications such as the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Bloomberg, The Rob Report, Architectural Digest, New York Times, LA Times, as well as other publications around the world. His sales have set numerous price records, including the communities of Manhattan Beach, Rolling Hills, Palos Verdes Peninsula, Belmont Heights, and Palm Springs. Currently, Gerard oversees the management of both Kaufman, Desert House, and Sun House for the European owner, both masterpieces designed by Richard Nuerta. Um, Nuerta, sorry. Um, <laughs> Gerard has been featured as a lecturer for the marketing of luxury and architectural homes and has appeared on numerous real estate shows. Um, he has been featured as an expert in the marketing of luxury and architectural homes in newspaper articles, TV, and radio. Um, Gerard is a lecturer for the Real Estate Accreditation Program for the Business and Law School at Loyola Marymount University here, where he teaches on residential real estate. In addition, he lectures on the influence of architecture on the arts, culture, and lifestyle in Southern California. Gerard has worked with professional athletes, chief executives of Fortune 500 companies, celebrities, and international business people. Um, he served eight years on the Redondo Beach City Council and has his undergraduate degree and MBA from LNU. Gerard has been married for over 32 years and lives in the community, so he's very, very local. And without further ado, here's Gerard. And a proud alumni. Yes. Say. Yeah, what a great panel we have today, but I have to compliment the last panel. They were extraordinary thought to myself, I wish I was that smart when I was in that stage of my career, that good looking. <laughs> but it was really extraordinary for those of you that were here. That was a wealth of information. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Very happy to be here. I was going to answer that. Here we go. All right. So it's great to see you all. It's great to see you. Great panel as well. Uh, thank you so much, Aaliyah, uh, for the introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming out to the Paths of Home Ownership Alumni Panel, uh, presented by Alumni and Family Engagement and the Real Estate Advisory Council. For those of you who were present for the first panel, this will be a reminder, but I would like to share with you all the work that REACT does on this campus. Known as the LMU Real Estate Advisory Council, REACT provides guidance, advice, and feedback to LMU. College of Business Administration on Business and Employment Trends in Real Estate. The Council offers direction on how to improve real estate curriculum and partners with the Real Estate Society to organize extracurricular activities to educate LMU students about careers in real estate and current trends. REACT awards scholarships to students interested in real estate, hosts an annual Real Estate Career Day, provides internships and job opportunities, and organizes networking events to engage real estate professionals. The Council also recently spearheaded a real estate certificate program for undergraduate and graduate students and law school students, which I am a proud member of, as is Edgar. Any, any other members of the, real, of the REACT for one? Also teaches a seminar for REACT, and it's an, it's an extraordinary program. We all have memories of how LMU helped to shape and grow us in our undergraduate and graduate careers, but that journey continues after you cross the stage and get your diploma. The Alumni and Family Engagement Office is still here to be a resource and support you as you navigate life in various ways. Today we are honored to provide this opportunity to gather as a community and think strategically about our future regarding home ownership. Our panel consists of talented and savvy experts from the real estate industry who are alumni just like you and me and are here to give back and share their wisdom. So uh, well, uh, I just want to say something that, we, uh, that was mentioned in the earlier panel and is probably the most important point when it comes to real estate and creating wealth in real estate. It's more wealth than being created in this nation in real estate than any other industry. So this is a great starting point for me. 
people that are thinking for the first time, or for, for those of you who are savvy investors, you can to continue to supplement your asset base. So what I'm going to do is introduce the panelists, and then I'm going to let them tell you about them. Is that proper English? <laughs> <laughs> In English. <laughs> that was the hybrid. Okay. So. First of all, Stephanie Younger, I'll, I'll introduce each one and then I'll let you each talk. Stephanie Younger, who I know uh, is unbelievable. She is a wealth of information and just amazingly successful and just a, a real uh, market player. Um, Edgar, I know as well. He specializes in 1031 exchanges, but he does other things as well. Smart guy, engaging, and a great communicator. And then Meredith, wait, and, or, I'm sorry, Edgar Arsencio. Okay, I had to clear that with my mind. And then Meredith Grushka, okay. And Meredith is a real player as well. She, she's, uh, I know she's very local, there's a lot of business. And we're really honored to have these alumni here with us. So uh, with that, can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> and then I'm gonna let you each introduce yourself to Stephanie. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm honored to be here, and I am actually an alum of the university from the class of 93, and um, remain also very involved at LMU. Uh, my, I met my husband here, married my college sweetheart, and uh, we live in the community, and he's a professor here at LMU as well, teaching in the English department. And um, I remain really connected to LMU through various ways, but most importantly through my work on the Board of Regents and the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts Board. So um, I get to meet a lot of alums and interface with a lot of students and really enjoy the fact that we can stay so connected to the university. Um, and I was not a business major, in fact, I was a uh, liberal arts major. I majored in classics and the humanities, uh, but somehow it translated to a good career in real estate. So I've been in real estate for 21 years I'm the CEO of the Stephanie Younger Group and team leader, and we have 25 agents on our team um, and 11 full-time staff people. And we work most regularly with residential home buyers and sellers, lots and lots of first-time buyers, and then stay in touch with those first-time buyers so they become repeat buyers to be able to um, grow their wealth through real estate, as we were talking about. Uh, we have an office here in Westchester and primarily focus on the west side of Los Angeles with a special emphasis in Westchester, Playa del Rey, and Playa Vista in particular. Um, and we really do um, end up working with a lot of people. Our, our network of LMU alums and faculty and staff has been a huge part of our business over these many years. So. Um, it's nice for me to be able to be here and give back to our LMU community today. So thank you very much for having me. That's great, thank you. Well, Edgar Asensio, if you were here for the first panel, you know me, I love real estate. I am a class of uh, 2012 MBA, and originally from Nicaragua. The reason that I chose LMU is because my blood, my family were a Jesuit family, and I went to Loyola in Nicaragua, and when I arrived uh, into the States, I only had one option, it was telling me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm proud to say that, I'm gonna tell you. Um, I feel uh, honored to be here, and I wanna give back as much as possible to the community, and it feels joyful to be here, uh, share my experience with you, and the stage with the this prop, Meredith and Stephanie, you are superstar, by the way. I read your bio and I'm very proud of you guys. Thank you. I'm Thank telling you. you. In the year 2000, uh, I made a decision to apply for a broker's license and I became a broker. So at that time when you pass your test and now uh, you go through the examination, and that was one of the happiest days in my life and I felt that I felt independence, you know, when I became a broker. I and I had to make a big decision, you know. Should I? go work for a brokerage company and get some experience or set up my own company. So I went ahead and chose the latter. So I went ahead and set up my own company in Torrance. So I have a brokerage company that specializes in brokerage. I represent investors. I have over 50 investors over the past 20 plus years. 
And I found a niche in the market, which is like JR says, 1031 exchange. So I find re replacement properties for clients. I'm also part of the REIT, the Real Estate Ad Ad Advisory Council, and I teach also 1031 exchange at the uh, Real Estate Certificate Program. So I give as much back to the community as I can to the school, and I'm proud to be in a, an LMU alumni uh, from 2012. I'm gonna share with you an experience, you know. Uh, in the year 2000 when I got my license, I had to make a decision to set up my company, where am I gonna go? Am I gonna be leasing an office space or perhaps save money and purchase a, an office building? So as a broker, you gain commissions. So that's one route that I took, I acquired my first office building. I saved money and I, I used an SBA loan and I purchased my office building in Torrance. So I've been there for the past 20 plus years. So I wanna tell you that I love real estate. This is one way that you can create wealth. Being here to take your first step to acquire that condo, townhouse, or home, or a duplex or a triplex, I highly recommend to, this is the best in a lifetime, 2023, it's an excellent year to do that. So I'm proud that you guys are here to hopefully get motivated and we can inspire you to take that step. Thank you. Hi, I'm Meredith. Um, I'm actually not an LMU alumni. I'm not sure why I'm here. <laughs> How did I get here? <laughs> we'll let you stay. <laughs> I actually work with Tammy Party at Party Properties in Venice, and she is an alumni. She couldn't be here today, so she asked for me to speak on her behalf. Um, but I've been working with Tammy and Party Properties for about almost eight years. Um, I started my career in fashion and corporate marketing, actually, in New York City. I'm a graduate of Michigan State University with um, a Bachelor of Arts in Apparel and Textiles, Communications, and French. Um, I met Tammy about seven or eight years ago, I should say. Um, when I was producing a photo shoot and we just had a really strong connection and I was thinking about a career change and my husband was actually the one who said, you know, you're wasting your time working in fashion. You should be working in real estate. You would be awesome. And I, I guess he was right. So <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I feel like I found my niche in life. I really enjoy working with people and um, getting to hear their stories and their needs and really creating those relationships because ultimately that's what real estate is actually about, is relationships between a buyer and a seller and their agent. Um, I mostly work with first time home buyers, so hopefully there's some of you out there today and um, sellers as well and just coordinating the whole process and making it as easy as possible. So thank you for having me too. So the first panel discussion was really about the fundamentals as you prep and you prepare to get into the market and start to go for a home. So what we're going to do here is sort of get, okay, what's the next step? Once you're ready to go, uh, uh, what happens? And so um, first question, we're going to jump right into that. Let me find it. So the first question, I'm gonna, we're going to focus on primary residence for this first question. However, it's, it would be totally appropriate if you want to sort of start to talk about how this applies to income properties as well. Okay? So the first question is, what are the best strategies and factors to consider when selecting an area to purchase real estate? And Stephanie, you want to start with you? Oh, sure. If you want to repeat that again. Uh, so the, it's about where, right? Yeah, what are, the, what are the best strategies and factors to consider when selecting an area of purchase? Well, I think um, I, I would always encourage somebody to think about lifestyle and where they want to live and what the implications of that location um, does for you and your quality of life. Um, sometimes people choose to be close to their work so that they don't have to um, have a lot of commute time, for example. Um, but that may mean that it's more expensive in that area closer to where you work and so maybe you're choosing to have a smaller property in exchange for a little bit more time in your life. Um, so I would always encourage somebody to be thinking really about their lifestyle and what the location 
versus the size of the property can really do for you. Um, after, I think, uh, you know, sort of buying and selling a number of homes myself and, and thinking so much about working where you live and living where you work, I've decided that my time is really important to me. And so um, I think really factoring in uh, distance to the places that you spend the most time I think is really important. If you've got a really strong connection to the ocean or, or hiking in the foothills, then you may want to choose a location based on where you spend your time on the weekends. Um, so I, I would think about location as a very holistic question. Um, even maybe before price or the kind of home that you're looking for. Um, and then of course, once you decide on that location, trying to pinpoint the area that over time will have um, the best chance of good appreciation for you. We have a lot of people, especially first time home buyers, that come to us and say, you know, well I need to be where the schools are really good. And they don't even have children yet. So you might be thinking that buying in a, in a in a location where you think your future children are gonna to go to school is important. But I might challenge you to be thinking about getting into the best location for your lifestyle today and for the next, let's say, three to five years, as opposed to being too worried about what it's gonna be like in five to 10 years. The likelihood is you'll be trading your home up, building your wealth, your real estate, and maybe buying your next house closer to where you think the schools might matter or um, other, other factors of appreciation might be important to you. So I'd be really thinking about lifestyle choices today. Yeah, Stephanie, I want to tell you that I echo what you're saying and uh, tell you the experience that I had just last week and you know, I hosted an open house in Granada Hills on a townhouse and uh, this buyer that we accepted uh, her offer, the family's offer, uh, we opened and asked her this week I asked her that question, why do you choose this location here, you know? And I learned so much from this couple. The reason that she chose that specific location is because she only wants to take her kids, her, her uh, son, to charter school. Mm -hmm. So the charter school was located, is located a few blocks away from this townhouse. And that was the reason why, you know? And I asked her, why charter school? Because, you know, the, uh, the parents are more close to the, uh, the school, they get involved, and so for her, private school, public school was not important, charter school was important. So she made that decision based on, um, right. on picking the charter school. It was not about, oh, I'm gonna be close to work, I don't wanna drive, I don't, I don't wanna commute for like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, it was that, that decision that she made, you know? And so it's up to you to uh, set up your own priorities you know, and that's something that you can uh, start thinking about that, you know, if you want to take that next step and select a sub-market. Do I want to be close to school or do you want to be close to work? Or perhaps, you, like as somebody said, you want there's a certain area that you like to be close to perhaps family members, you know, that would be another choice. So that's something to think about, you know. Um, but uh, if you're planning to make a decision to Select a sub select a sub market. That's some consideration to have, you know, school or or family. Um, for me, I I work with a lot of people who have been renting in a certain area. So the natural step is to want to buy in the area they've been living, um, and that's great. And to Stephanie's point, you really have to that that will of course sometimes limit you based on your budget. Um, so what I tell my buyers is to really cast a wide net. So if you're renting in Santa Monica, let's say, and you love Santa Monica, you want to live there, but you can't necessarily afford it, you should really, you know, cast a wider net to West LA, to Mar Vista, Venice, Marina del Rey, um, and the surrounding, even Culver City, the surrounding areas, so that I've had a lot of buyers, you know, who have, have found a house in an area or a neighborhood that they were like, oh my God, I didn't even know this existed and it's amazing I love it even more than I where I have been living so you know you're kind of perhaps missing an opportunity by not casting a wide net dirt with your home search um, something else that I I consider when I'm helping guide my clients is of course affordability but like Stephanie said their lifestyle where they work um, how far their commute will be but then also you know, is this an investment property? Is this something that you're just wanting to live in for three to five years and then upgrade? 
Um, is this your second, third home? So there's a variety of factors that go into strategizing where you're, what area you're going to be in. But I think keeping an open mind is my best suggestion. That's all great advice. Any other, any other comments within that? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I do have one comment. Um, I do think that uh, one thing we probably all hear from, uh, from buyers, especially buyers who are new to the market, is thinking about your purchase on a very long time horizon. And one thing we, we end up learning is that most people who think they're going to be in their house for five, seven, 10 years are probably in their house for three to five years maximum. And our clients move a lot more than I think you might assume they do. And so the idea that you have to buy your forever home in your first purchase is something you might want to unhook from because it'll give you more opportunities to get in the market now. Um, buy something that's a little smaller right now because it's a little bit more affordable but in a better location or buying in a location that's not your top choice but gives you the size you need um, might just get you into the market. And so uh, the, I think the bigger mistake that people make often is waiting too long to have every box checked and you know, I would say before the market of the pandemic, we would tell you like if you could find 85% of what you were looking for, you should absolutely buy that house because the inventories have come down so much. We're coaching our buyers to say, if it's like 60 to 70% correct for you, that's the kind of house you should be thinking about. So you really do have to make a list of your priorities and then go looking for a house that fits those priorities but be flexible right now as you're trying to get into the market because as you probably heard earlier today, taking your first step in real estate is how you're going to get into that house that fits more like 80 to 100% of your priorities the next time around. Yeah, and uh, I call that choosing or uh, making a decision to purchase your bridge property. You know, that first property could be a bridge property. You know? Think about long-term, short-term. Chances are you're gonna be in that property within five years and then start thinking about something else. So condo townhomes is excellent because the price is lower than a home. So that's something to consider. As a first time buyer, you can go out of the area. You don't have to stay in LA County. You can go outside the area and you know, bang for your buck, right? You can, you can get uh, more. And so that's uh, something to consider, you know. Bridge property in the beginning, uh, set up your priorities. That's you have to check all the boxes. Yeah, and to that point, I, I completely agree. Getting into the market should really be your first priority because there's people who sit on the bench and watch everyone else do it and watch them gain equity and wealth and then they are just spectators, they're not participants. So um, I think it is extremely important to just get into the market. The first home that my husband and I bought was by no means perfect at all, but it's tripled in price since we bought it 10 years ago. So that's a really good example of just, you know, getting into the market and getting something that may not be perfect, but that you can build wealth through. You know, the first uh, home that I purchased, my first property was a, a house in Fontana. I mean, driving, what, an hour and a half? Oh, yeah. You know, why did I buy it? It was under 150,000. Wow. You know, the opportunity was there, I jumped on it. So if you see an opportunity on a property that you, you like, doesn't have to be all the criteria, but just get into it, you know, so uh, the opportunities are always there when it's already in down market, upper market, so uh, buy your rich property now. Great, great, major takeaways, okay? Set your goals and priorities. You have a list of what you need, and I think 80% is about right, I say four out of five. So you're not gonna find the perfect home, and it's not your last home, especially if you're a first time buyer. And then find it, know you can afford it, and go watch wealth be created by you just living in it. Okay, great, great points. All right, we'll get to the second question. Edgar, we're gonna start with you. Okay. Okay, so what is the typical timeline, <laughs> typical, there's no timeline, <laughs> typical timeline for residential real estate purchase. So what I'm gonna do is kind of narrow those parameters for you guys, because we know there's no typical. But from, the, from just what would be what would you might call standard, from the time they sit with the client for the first time and they've given you their goals, their priorities, and their checklist, what, what would you say would be, again, typical, tough word under these circumstances, a typical timeline from the time you get these clients together for the first time, go show them a house to the time you get an offer accepted? 
basically, keep in mind that, generally speaking, a transaction takes about 30 to 45 days. So keep that in mind. So it's so important to have that documentation ready to take that first step to make the offer. So it's like mandatory. Now, in the market, you have to have that pre-approval letter. How many of you guys are working on pre-approval letters right now? Anybody? So keep that in mind. That's, that will be one of your first steps when you get, make that decision to purchase that house, get that pre-approval letter ready, and what is, we call DU, desktop underwriting findings. What that is is that you'll sit down with the mortgage banker, they'll run your credit, and they'll look at your income and expenses and tell you, okay, you can qualify up to this sales price. So once you have those two documents ready to go, and that can take a, like a week. You know, it doesn't have to take too long. You know? Within a week, you'll have, get that pre-approval, that desktop underwriting, and then you start. You can start finding a property and making that offer. Once that offer is accepted, the purchase agreement is accepted, that timeline takes about 30 days on average. Sometimes it's 45 days. So within that timeline of 30 days, the first week, seven days, you have some contingencies you have to do. You can do inspections, you can do appraisal, but there are some timelines that you and, and the buyer and your agent can get together. You know? Once again, generally speaking, 30 day escrow or 45. But most important, before you make that offer, please get ready for those, those, those two documents. Pre-approval, DU. Pre-approval, DU, this is a must. If you don't have these documents, your offer is not going to be competitive with somebody else's. So it doesn't take too long to get that information ready. A lot of people, they, they say, oh, I don't wanna run my credit yet, you know? So once you make that decision to take that next step, that will be what you need to get. That documentation is mandatory. Meredith, the timeline from when you first meet a buyer to the time you finally get an offer accepted. Well, every buyer, of course, is different. So I've had buyers who I've shown a property to, or properties, I should say, for a week, and we start writing offers. I've had buyers who look for a place for a year or two. Um, so <laughs> it really depends on the buyer and how particular they are. But So it can really go as fast as a week before you start writing offers, or as slow as a year or two, if you really want to keep looking. I don't recommend that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, to Edgar's point, it, a typical escrow period is 30 days. So upon acceptance of the offer, typically an escrow period will be 30 days. If you're paying cash, it can be as quick as seven days to 14 days. But I would say on average, my escrows are 21 to 30 days. So you can plan on moving, like hiring a moving truck after 30 days, which is really exciting. It's actually really fast. Uh, I think one thing that's interesting about the home buying process is that once you find the house, it's quite a short process, really. And so, like Meredith said, it can really be what happens before that that takes quite a long time. And so, one of the things that we recommend and do on our team is have a meeting with you, a home buyer consultation in our office to go through the entire process point by point, and ideally before we ever even show you a house and help you make that list of priorities that we talked about before and get you on the path to think to, to get yourself ready to buy a home. Um, I'm always an advocate for if you're thinking today that you know you need to save a certain amount of money and it's going to take you a year to do that so you're going to call me in a year I'd rather you call me now actually let us have that consultation with you and let us get you passively looking at homes, either stopping in an open house from here from time to time or getting you set up um, with a collection so that we can, so we can um, feed you houses that we think are interesting to you. So by the time you actually have your money in your hand, you have your DU approval, you're actually ready to write offers, you're quite educated about the process, about the market, you've narrowed your focus about the kind of house you're looking for. And we, we love to talk to people a year or more in advance. We're not gonna bug you and call you every month, but we wanna put you in, in a position to be receiving the right kind of information over those year, over that year while you're prepping, because you might just think it's about saving a down payment, but maybe we need to get your credit cleaned up. Maybe we need to 
Um, maybe you don't need to save as much money as you think you do. Maybe there's a 5% loan option available to you right now. Um, and so sometimes you think that you, you're not going to be ready for a year. When we sit down and go through those priorities and look at your whole financial package, it may be that you could do something sooner. And for example, this might be the best time that we've seen in the last two years to buy a house because home buyers have a little more leverage than home sellers do today. And that could change a year from now. So don't wait too long to get the professional advice that you need. Um, and you can always get on a timeline with somebody who's really good at what they do and isn't going to put pressure on you, but will help you to be educated in the right way over these coming months. Yeah, just the last comment is that um, if you see an opportunity, you act on the opportunity. Don't think that raising capital is important. It is important, but it is not priority. Why? To your, uh, Christine, I think you asked that question before. Uh, if you don't have enough income to qualify and so forth, keep in mind that you can uh, you can buy that that home or that duplex with somebody else as a partner, you know. And so you don't have to wait to raise all that capital because you have yours and you can combine it with somebody else. Combine, then you there's more more purchasing power. So just keep that in mind. Don't let the dumping hold you back. Remember, we talked about those loan programs uh, before, you know. So just keep that in mind. It's more about looking at the opportunity and setting yourself up to have a good FICO score, because that's super important, you know? And that can take time. And that can take time, yeah. yeah. Meredith, anything there? No, you guys <laughs> took the words off my mouth. <laughs> well, the major takeaway is really that a good agent helps you set your expectations and helps you sort of gather the foundation for moving forward. One point I'll make, I know you all agree, and I think it's been mentioned, is that even if you think you're not ready to buy because of a down payment, I just was involved with a transaction where, and there were multiple offers, but the seller actually sold to a young man that wanted to do a lease option because they liked him so much. He had some money for the, to buy the option to purchase the home, and uh, he was able to get into the home even though he didn't have what was the, the substantial, it was substantial what he gave to buy the option to purchase the property. And he didn't have enough money for the 20% down payment. So there's, especially in this market, there's creative options because, as has been said, it is really more of a buyer's market right now. We don't know how long this window is going to be here. Mm -hmm. Did you have something? Well, and I think uh, what's happened over the last couple of years in particular is you 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 were told by the media or by friends who bought a house that if you didn't have your you know cash or all cash and you weren't you know approved right now that you could not buy a house. Well, that has changed, and even as agents, there are some things that my my agents are coming to me saying. Uh, what's a lease option? I thought I had to, <laughs> I remember that from my class and I've never even had to entertain doing it, but we're really seeing some creative financing, seller financing, things that we haven't really seen, not just for two years, but for 10 years. And so I think that this is really a great time for first time buyers, but don't think that you have to wait to get some advice. Uh, that would be if I could get, deliver you one message, it would be start early, identify a partner that you trust that takes the time to educate you, that can get you in touch with financial advisors who can help you seek creative options, um, and you'd be surprised at how much you can accomplish. And it's exciting what's happening right now in the market. I tell you, uh, Stephanie, she mentioned that seller financing. Oh, so great. I mean, it, this is it's happening now. I'm experiencing this like now, and I have experienced this in five years at least where you have a seller selling this property, you may have perhaps 3.5% down, maybe less. But that seller is willing to carry back a loan on you. In other words, they'll give you a second trustee on that property. So keep that in mind, there are always an alternative way to raise the capital and to purchase that home. Well, oh yeah, I, I will. You're you're you reminded me of something too, because yeah. it, in the height of the market of the last two years, um, I had a listing in Inglewood, and we received 11 offers, and some of them were cash, and they were all, of course, very competitive. But my seller liked one of the buyers because they and they had an FHA loan, so they were only putting five percent down compared to everybody else who was putting 20 percent down or paying cash. And she said, when I was buying my home, I had an FHA loan, and it was so hard for me to get a house. And somebody finally took a chance on me, and I want to give that back to these buyers. And it, we had a successful close, a wonderful transaction. 
And it's really a beautiful story, but it's also a lesson that, you know, don't get in your own way. And we tell our agents on our team that, and buyers, because it, the worst that anyone's gonna say is no, it doesn't cost you anything to write an offer. It doesn't cost you anything to get a pre-approval letter. Um, I do recommend always talking to a few lenders so you ensure that you're getting the best interest rate because different lenders do have access to different types of loans and programs. Um, so that is definitely key in the process, but don't be afraid to just throw your hat in the ring because you just never know. Great advice, great advice. So, takeaway again, a good agent like the three that are up here and the three who are in the past battle, they're gonna help you set your expectations and weave through potential opportunities, creative opportunities that you may not have thought about. So, very, very good, thank you. Uh, question three, I'm gonna rework this question just a little bit, okay? So what, what I wanna ask is during the escrow period, the inspection process can be quite daunting for a buyer and for a seller, frankly. So can you talk about some of the some of the pitfalls, some of the dynamics, some of the red flags, or some of the things you do to get through an inspection? Just because you get a bad inspection doesn't mean that, that your client shouldn't buy the house. And a lot of people really, because we do this so many times during the year, but for a home buyer, you may buy a home three or four times in the course of your lifetime. So a red flag may seem like just a, a deal breaker, and we know it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that. So Meredith, if we start with you, can you talk about some of the inspection process uh, within the escrow period? Sure, this is a very fun topic, and probably every agent's least favorite part of the transaction. <laughs> Um, because it leads up to what's called a request for repair, and I will explain that process as well. But, um, you know, there's always, first of all, there's always gonna be something with every house, even if it's actually new construction. I work with a lot of developers who do brand new construction homes and the windows are leaking or whatever it is. There's always a punch list item. So you have to bear that in mind going in. Again, we keep talking about setting expectations, and I think that's so important because it's really, First of all, freaking out is not, and panicking will not do anything that's not gonna change anything. So I think going into it calm and just understanding, okay, some things are gonna come up is really normal. Um, I think the biggest thing that probably throws buyers off and scares them is the word foundation because they hear the word foundation and think the house is going to fall over. That is not true. I mean, it's possible, but very unlikely. You have to remember that most homes in LA were built in the early 1900s and, and through the 40s, 50s, 60s, obviously every year um, since we've been here. Um, but they also withstood a lot of earthquakes. So that's, that's good that the houses are still standing because they went through the 94 earthquake um, and they're still standing and cracks in foundation are very normal. Um, and everything is fixable, yes it takes money and time, but everything is fixable. And I have never come across, I've come across homes that have um, the foundation made out of sand, which I know sounds crazy, but it's actually not. That's very common too, because back in the day in the 1910s and 20s, they did combine concrete with sand. So <laughs> again, nothing can surprise us, but um, buyers hear that and they're like, oh my God, the house is gonna sink any day now. Um, but everything's fixable. But that, so during that inspection process, it's typically per the contract, 17 days. I always like to shorten that because 17 days is usually not necessary and it makes your offer more competitive. So I would say my buyer's inspection periods are typically 10 days. And during that time, I really act as like a concierge service and, and schedule all those inspectors for them. So I recommend, you know, this house needs a general inspection, termite inspection, sewer inspection, roof, foundation. Um, and the list goes on and on. Mold, you know, there's a million different types of inspections, but those are the key ones. And then we gather all that information, all of the reports, and again, I'm completely making this up, but let's say there is something wrong with the foundation and the house needs to be tented for termites. So we do what's called um, a request for repair. So if I'm representing the buyer, I, I go through it, I get quotes, um, on what the work will entail from the vendors or a general contractor. And then we put that list together and submit it to the sellers to ask for a credit towards repairs. And that's another thing, building expectations for buyers. This is not a buffet. So you can't just go through and be like, well, I don't really like these countertops, let's throw that in. 
I want money uh, credit towards the paint. It really is health and safety items. And the request for repair and the reason why we don't like it because it's like ripping off a Band-Aid. It's like the most uncomfortable part of the transaction because you're asking for money from the seller. They don't want to give it. The buyer, of course, wants as much as possible, but it's really a fine line because the second you do start asking for things that are not really reasonable, it, you can really shoot yourself in the foot as the buyer because what will happen is you piss off the seller and then they don't want to give you anything. So that's what we're here to do is guide our buyers on what is reasonable and what is not. Of course, health and safety, and that's why I'm really emphasizing that those are reasonable items. Those are good examples of something to ask for. Um, and so then there's a little bit of negotiation that goes back and forth uh, between the buyer's agent and listing agent on the request for repair, and then you come to an agreement on how much that credit will look like, um, whether it's splitting it down the middle or you know giving the whole amount, whatever it is. Um, it, of course, depends on the seller, what you're asking for, and the relationship between the buyer's agent and listing agent. So that's the very brief description of how that works. I'm just gonna point out that you will rely on your agent to determine what inspections or follow-up or supplemental inspections are required. This isn't up to you. Uh, your agent will guide you through this. And, and the amount of inspections you do, and I'm sure somebody would say this about the same. The inspections that you'll do will depend on your area. Like if you're in Palos Verdes, where I'm from, you'll do a soils inspection, but you may not be doing them in Marina Del Rey, but you may be doing uh, radon inspection, and I won't even get into that. Or you might have to, yes, we yeah, yeah. wouldn't necessarily do another part. So your agents will help you with a checklist of the initial inspections, and sometimes you'll need to follow up. Uh, Stephanie, or Edgar, or Lee. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the challenges that comes along when you're buying a home is that you get to see it once or maybe twice before you have to put an offer on. You've been in there maybe 30 minutes, if you're lucky, an hour total, and you can't really look under the hood the way you probably would like to. You probably look at a car more than you look at a house, and you know what you're talking about, a much different type of purchase. Um, and in Southern California in particular, you're not getting a lot of advanced information. So you don't have reports from the seller before you get to buy the house. But the good news is that part of your standard contract allows you the full right to cancel if you find something out that you really don't like. So I think there's a lot of trepidation around, um, especially for, for first time home buyers who don't really know what goes into the process of building a home or maintaining a home or, or how you should judge the condition of the home. You do have this sort of peace of mind of knowing that you will have time to look at the house from top to bottom, inside and out, and if it's something really dramatic that you can't get your head around, that you will have the right to cancel and get your deposit back. So I think for, for me, that's a, a message that you should just not worry about it. Making an offer is fundamentally free. Um, and you do have to put your deposit in, but your deposit comes back for, if you wanna cancel for any reason, like you go in there and you don't like the countertops after all, if you don't want to ask the seller to change them, which you probably shouldn't, um, although it depends on the market, <laughs> um, you know, you do really get to cancel. Now, should you do that? No. But it's just, I want to give you peace of mind. Then from there, your agent is going to say, here are all the you know, 20 or 30 different kinds of inspections that are available to you. Here's what's most commonly done. And let's do those inspections and then meet together to decide what items are of concern to you or not of concern to you. And if you don't know, I'll help you interpret them. So this isn't sort of like a, hey, buyer beware, you know, you're gonna buy this house and something's gonna come up later and it's gonna be your problem. That's not the way it works. You do have a real opportunity to understand what it is you're buying. Um, but you know, every house in Los Angeles is primarily an old house, and they all come with their little issues, but that's part of the fun of buying a house too, is you know, maybe you choose to buy a house with countertops you don't like, so that you can go and fix them and change them yourself in the future. Just to put in perspective uh, what we said is, so we have a, so you made the offer, the offer was accepted, you open escrow, within three days, you put in the earnest deposit. So you have 17 days or less to convert this in 
you have to conduct that inspection. 100% of the times that I have represented a buyer, I always encourage that buyer to hire an inspection company to come and inspect the property or spend two, three hours and give you 50, 60 pages of something that is wrong with the property. Even a brand new property, brand new house, you don't find something that is wrong. But you have to be smart about what you're gonna be requesting, what kind of request for repairs you're gonna be requesting. In the city of LA, uh, you also have this uh, retrofitting inspection. You have to have, it's mandatory that you have to have a certificate of compliance. Make sure that there's earthquakes, um, gas shut off all, tempered glass, so you have to have that certificate of compliance, so that's mandatory in the city of Los Angeles. All that can be done within that 17 day period after your offer is accepted. So I always recommend once again, to hire that professional who can come and inspect the property, even if you're not gonna be asking for no repairs. It's a peace of mind that you will have. To have that report with you, you spend maybe two, three hundred dollars, and it's money well spent if you're gonna buy that property. So that's my recommendation to you. Great, takeaway is to work with a very experienced agent who can help you navigate many pitfalls of the inspection process and get it over the goal line. All right, question number four. So what, the question number four is a little combination of question three and five, but what do you need to know when making an offer on a house? What are some of the tools that you can use to negotiate the price and terms for a purchase? And these terms are the first, right? Well, we, I think we've already been touching on some of these things. Um, and uh, not to overplay this, a good agent can really guide you through the process. But again, I think if you're reaching out to somebody, you know, it is it is sort of, I, I don't know about you too, but I am finding that um, that more and more buyers are, are hesitant to connect with an agent too early and wanna do a lot of sort of pre-work on their own. And then once we make that connection, you find that it's really a much bigger and more kind of detailed education process than you might have thought otherwise. So um, really starting that process early is extremely important. Um, but what I would say too is making sure that you ask your agent, what are the strategies that you use to help me win or be successful in the negotiation of my offer? And you would really want to make sure that the agent that you're working with has a strategy and can outline strategies both in a multiple offer situation or in a single offer situation. And that's the way, you know, the way that agent can explain to you their process of negotiation is how you can trust that they're going to be advocating for you in the negotiation throughout the process. So um, I think that the, the things that you need to know when making an offer, like we mentioned earlier, you're not going to have all of the condition items around the house that's going to happen later. So the things that you really need to know are, you know, what are your qualifications as a buyer? And then also, how is this house valued and priced? Is the price appropriate for the value of the property in the community that it's in? Have you seen data to support the price? If the price is high and you're going to have to pay more, does your agent have a way to articulate that strategy to, to you and at least get comfortable with that? Are you always going to be able to know that you're paying the price for the house that is, um, that's supported by the value? No, in the last couple of years, for example, people have paid prices where there, weren't, there was no support for that value because the idea was get into a house. Most people made money, luckily, in those purchases. Um, so you're not always gonna get to say that, hey, you know, this house is absolutely worth the price I'm being asked to pay. But knowing that information and making sure that you're comfortable either way is really, really important. So I would make sure that you've been educated around the market value and that your agent has articulated the strategy for um, being successful in that negotiation, whether it's a multiple offer or whether it's a single party negotiation and maybe you have some opportunity to get a better price than you uh, might otherwise. And it's amazing that there's so many tools available. How many of you look at Zillow maybe at least once a week? <laughs> How about Trulia? Realtor.com? Redfin? I mean, most of us, right? So to your point, Stephanie, that we have to make sure that the price per square foot justifies the sales price. In other words, look at all those 
sales comparables in the area in the past month, two months, three months, and see if that price that you're offering is gonna be close to that sales comparable. So why is that important? Keep in mind that once you're accepted, you've got an offer that is accepted, the bank is gonna send an appraiser to appraise the property and make sure that while you're asking for the for the property, what the, uh, the, the seller approved, is what the appraiser is gonna say. So it's super important to rely on those tools as well. Um, I'm gonna start from the beginning because um, Edgar had said earlier about getting your pre-approval set up with your with your lender. So that, that really is the first step before you even start making offers because in order to make an offer, you need a pre-approval letter from your lender. Um, and you'll also need your proof of funds. A proof, proof of funds simply means like a screenshot of the bank account where your down payment and closing costs are coming from. So those two things are really crucial um, when making an offer. But as an agent, we do what's called running comps, looking at comparable sales in the area because to Stephanie's point, you wanna determine if the house that you're making an offer on is priced with in, in line with market value, is it priced too high or is it priced under market value to gain a lot of attraction and potentially a lot of offers? Um, the last few deals I closed, actually, I, all, I negotiated all of them under the asking price because the market has shifted and become more of a buyer's market than seller's market. It was a seller's market the last two years, and that's just basic economics that ebbs and flows every few years. Um, now we're shifting into a buyer's market, and um, the way I did that was by looking at the history of the property. So for one, one example, um, a home in Venice, had just sold the year before for $200,000 less um, than what they were asking. So I'm like, well, 250K is a lot of equity in one year. So, um, you know, uh, with that information, I went to the listing agent, I'm like, what's the story with the seller? What's going on? So it's really also getting the scoop from the listing agent and seeing how motivated the sellers are, what the temperature of the buyer is, or of the seller is, do they have to sell? Do they need to unload this? How motivated are they? So with all of that information, you can. I, I was able to negotiate it 100,000 under the asking price and the seller actually lost money on the house when it was all said and done, but my buyers were happy because they got a good deal. So, um, so that's just one example. Another example is a house in Laurel Canyon that I just closed on um, where they had been in escrow, it fell out, the seller was extremely motivated, so they dropped the price $100,000 after it fell out of escrow and put it back on the market. So my buyer came to me and she's like, I need this house, I want this house, what do we do? I said, you need to come in full asking price because this is now way under market value. It actually appraised $300,000 more than what she paid for it. So upon closing, she had quite a bit of equity. Um, so she was also very happy, but those are, reading, reading the room really is what's important. Knowing the history of the property, and what things are selling for, um, running comps, like I said. When, when I say running comps, that means looking at um, properties that are apples to apples, as much as possible. So same bedroom, bathroom count, square footage, lot size, condition of property. So those are all things you wanna look at when making an offer. My other strategy is really becoming best friends with the listing agent when I'm representing the buyer because what people might not necessarily, and as a buyer, especially a first time buyer, you might not realize is um, sellers want to work with a great buyer who they think is well qualified and is going to close, but listing agents want to work with a buyer's agent who is also going to close the deal. So having that good relationship between me or you know whoever as a buyer's agent and the listing agent is very crucial because it really does make the deal go a lot better and and then when you do come to that moment where you're doing the request for repair, all of a sudden it's not as painful. So those are my personal strategies in getting offers accepted. I, I, I would just synthesize a couple of points across this, which is I think we'd all agree that it's usually in a buyer's best interest to work with an agent who has expertise in either the particular niche of the market, like 1031 exchange, or the particular geography of the market. And you know, each of us probably knows a few people who have their real estate license, but that sort of one-off person who doesn't have a lot of experience in the in the day-to-day, -day, what's happening right now in the market, typically is going to be able to help you 
connect with the listing agent in the same way, understand the niche product in the same way, or maybe understand the value in the same way that an expert can to help negotiate you the best price possible. Um, whether that's a price over the asking or a price under the asking. Uh, the other tool, I think, just uh, to answer the question very specifically, and you know, it's, it's sort of evolved in the last couple of years, but usually when you're talking about single family or you know, um, regular residential real estate, sellers and agents are really interested often in who the buyer is. And so there is a way to articulate, I mean, we've called it the buyer love letter, um, you know, there is a way to articulate in a way that's very, um, that's very objective why this house works for you and what your commitment to the process is. And so that's something else that you might want to be starting early with your agent, trying to identify how you're going to articulate to the agent and the seller what your commitment to the process is. So having that letter is, is really valuable, having your pre-approval, having your expert, having your funds ready to go. Um, and then in addition, having some strategies around um, different negotiation tactics that can help with price, uh, you know, firm timelines, escalation clauses, things that, that can help differentiate you from the uh, from the, the market at large. We have one on our team that is sort of funny, um, but we call it the dangler. And it's it's just that thing of sometimes if you, even in a market like this, if there's if there are three buyers, but they're all writing full price offer, but your offer is $1,000 more, the dangler price, sometimes you'll win by $1,000. So finding little ways to differentiate your offer from other people's offers, now you're all gonna use the dangler. <laughs> I've been using that. Okay, <laughs> but did you call it the dangler no. though? All right. Um, but you know, this is, these are little things you can do to differentiate your offer. It's not spending more money in a way that changes the functionality, but it helps to differentiate you amongst <coughs> other people. Yeah, and also, you know, your time period, you know, 17-day inspection, make it 12, make it 10, shorter the time, you know, you can differentiate yourself that way. I feel so excited about 2023. I'm telling you, I see that in Torrance, 50, 60% of listing, they have reduced the price substantially, at least five, 10%. You'll see, look at Zillow, your area that you're looking for, you'll see a lot of price reduction. So that's an opportunity for you to acquire this property at a, at a better price. Right. So I'm very hopeful for 2023. Thank you, I'm gonna put a bow on this one, okay? So the major takeaway, I think, is that you need to know the value of a home going in. We've heard a lot about Zillow. I'm gonna give you this, I'm gonna give you a statistic. There's, Zillow has it, what they call Zestimate. And uh, that says, you know, based on their algorithm, here we, here's what we think the value of that home is. Well, there was a study, and this is very recent, that only 47, Zillow is only right 47% of the time. Mm -hmm. that says, but what a good agent with the MLS is able to give you the comps, which is uh, the comparison of value, 98%. Okay. So what does it go back to? Good agent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're going, you know, we want to make sure we have time for questions. So we're going to hit this last, you know, we'll, we'll yeah, we're talking. I feel like we talked about that one a little bit. Yeah. Of, well, uh, however, let's just talk briefly, okay? Just about the offer and counter offer process. We have hit this, but maybe just in very succinctly, because at the end of the day, it's all about the offer and counters. Stephanie. Oh, Edward, you go. I, I, just real, real quick. I, an example that happened to me last week. You know, on, on another transaction I'm doing. You know, we have three offers on this uh, property, so you can do counter offer or you can do multiple counter offer. The difference is that counter offer, you as a seller, there's only one buyer wants to buy that property, so you can do a counter offer. You can do multiple counter, you send in a message to the seller that there are more than two, three buyers for that property. So basically, those buyers are competing with each other, that's why you create that counter offer, that multiple counter offer. Can you imagine that you as a seller, by the way, on the other side, you're, you're feeling so good knowing that you have three offers and those three buyers do not have to know how much they're offering. So that's why you're making that counter offer. To, so they can compete with each other and they give you the highest and best. 
But now the market is more about you as a buyer, we call it, let's make a clean off, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's, that's the key to success. Clean offer, what's a clean offer? Don't ask for repairs, don't ask for concessions. Mm -hmm. Just if you feel that this is the right price, after you do your homework, your data, then just make a clean offer. So that's my recommendation to you. Good advice, Mary. Okay, I'll give you a quick overview of the purchase agreement. So, it, first of all, it's written by the California Association of Realtors, so it's not a contract that we're writing. We're really just filling in the terms of the agreement. So you can rest easy. Some people are like, do I need a lawyer to read this? It was written by lawyers, so it's pretty ironclad, and it really um, protects the buyer with uh, having contingencies in place. So if you did want to back out of the deal, you have, have those contingencies in place, so that you can do so. The three major contingencies are the inspection contingency, which we spoke about, um, and Stephanie explained how you can still back out if you find something with the property that you're not comfortable with. The second is the appraisal contingency. Um, that means if the house is appraised, the appraiser is a, a neutral third party who comes in, so he has no relation to the buyer, the seller, or the lender. Um, he or she determines the value of the home based on comparable sales and condition. Um, so if that were to come in under value, you as the buyer would be responsible for making up the difference between the appraised value and the purchase price, the, the price you're in contract for, in cash. If you can't do that, uh, an agent, a good agent, will renegotiate the price and to the appraised value. That doesn't always work because you are locked in to whatever you agreed upon from the get-go. So, um, you know, that's... Luckily, that rarely happens. Usually, appraiser, appraisals do come in at the purchase price value. Sometimes they come in higher. So, um, but that's kind of a bridge you cross when you get there. But if it did come in under value and you're responsible for making up the difference, you can back out for that reason as well. The third contingency is the loan contingency. So, appraisal and loan contingencies kind of go hand in hand. But if there were any reason during the process that if you weren't already underwritten, and something went wrong and you actually aren't approved for the loan, you can back out for that reason as well. So that's a very high level overview of the purchase agreement. Um, in terms of counter offers, um, you know, they, they can really say anything on them. Not, no counter offer is usually the same. So it can be the purchase price that the seller is countering you on. It can be the escrow timeline. It can be the inspection contingency period. It can be a, a numerous thing. So that really just varies based on the, the transaction. Stephanie, take us home on this. <laughs> very briefly, I would just say, I mean, that was excellent, by the way. Very, very, like, you know, 10 second overview. I loved it. Um, you know, the, this is a vehicle to allow you to negotiate back and forth. And sometimes people will say, you know, well, that price house is a million dollars. I'm not paying a million dollars. I'll wait for that seller to reduce their price. Or the seller's gonna say, you know, I won't accept anything lower than my list price. Put your offer on a purchase agreement in writing and get it in front of that seller. The worst thing that happens is they say no. And be ready to negotiate. I mean, if you buy a car, you all wanna negotiate, but sometimes buyers will say to us, like, I don't wanna go back and forth on this. I just wanna give them one price and if they don't accept it, I'm done. Be open to going back and forth. You can have 100 counter offers if you really needed to. Um, I think the most I ever had was 14. Um, but you know, I mean, I want, I want you to know that this is a chance for you to, to get a contract with a seller that represents the best price and terms that the two of you can come to. And in a negotiation like that, I, I always like to say, it's gotta be a grandma deal, that your grandma would feel good about it at the end of the day, meaning you're not gonna get everything you want, the seller's not gonna get everything they want, but grandma would say, it's a good deal. <laughs> Great. Great stuff, guys, really excellent. Can we give them a big round of applause? They're going to be around after for specific questions, autographs, photos, <laughs> baby kissing, <laughs> whatever. So, do you have any questions? Sir, your name? Uh, Kelsey. Kelsey. Yeah. Would you guys be able to uh, kind of expound when you said the lease, like the lease to buy? Like, what's the scenario that you kind of started about? Uh, 
this option. Yes. Yeah. Where they, they have the option to buy. Like, you know, it happens when, for some reason, the buyers are not qualifying for the loan. More, more so, like, what does the terms look like if they do agree? Right, so once they agree on the lease option, let's say, okay, seller, okay, let's do a lease option. So what it is is that you set up an escrow account and the payment that you make towards that rent, a portion of it is going to go into that escrow account. That escrow account, you're going to save that money and that's going to be accounted for your down payment in the future. So you can do a lease option maybe for two, three years. You know, and this is one way that you can acquire that property as long as the seller is, is open to the idea. But it, it's it's amazing that those thoughts, that uh, strategy, is coming back. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's coming back. Yeah. You're actually buying the option to purchase the property at a future date. Okay. You control the property. If the seller says yes, you actually control that property for the option. Period. However, if you don't exercise the option at the end of the three bond price, which can always be amended, then you actually lose your option money. Then you must perform by the time or at the end of the option period, uh, which means get a loan and actually close escrow. So type of Anything else to add? I would just say it typically does take a small, you know, you have, you're gonna put a down payment of some kind, but it's typically smaller. Um, and then for example, if the rent on the property was 2,500, you're paying maybe 5,000, and 2,500 of that is going toward, is your option price, it's going toward your future payment, um, and you're predetermining the price now on where you're gonna buy it in two or three years. So um, I would say it's a great option in, in today's market. I think there may be still better options, like I wanted to tell you all that um, there's a 5% down for first time home buyers up to $800,000 loan amounts right now, at 5.9% interest. It's probably better than a lease option because 5% is a pretty low barrier to entry. Um, so, uh, but I think it's a great strategy, um, but look for creative financing first. Great advice, great advice. Other questions? Yes, uh, sir, right here. Uh, your name? Uh, CJ. CJ. Uh, how long does the pre-approval and uh, DU documents last for? Those are valid for three months typically, and do you, I mean, I have lenders who can get people pre-approved within 24 hours. Yeah, yeah, pre-approval letter in some, yeah, right, less than a couple hours you need that pre-approval. Did yeah. you, you may take a couple of days, you know, yeah. two, three days, but, uh, but it's so important that you need to have those two documents to make your offer clean and strong. Somebody, yeah. okay. And some other, yes, sir. Uh, what would you say is like you guys have experience with listing and uh, doing listings? What would you say is the uh, seller's hesitation with FHA finance? Because the money's all coming from the same place for the most part. Yeah. yeah. Well, some of the hesitation is um, FHA loans do have some different qualifications when it comes to the amount of repairs. Okay. So, that can throw a wrench in things if the property is not in great condition, you know, meaning it could be the roof, it could be the foundation, so there's a threshold okay. that needs to be met. So that that's sometimes the hesita hesitation there. I would say with FHA and VA loans um, in general, there tends to be some bias because it, uh, sellers often feel like a larger down payment is more secure. So part of this is making sure that you and your agent understand these types of loans and help to get the listing agent to understand these types of loans. So your mortgage broker needs to call the listing agent and really walk through how strong of a candidate you are. Um, because if you can get a 0% VA loan, you should take that loan. But it, it is sometimes harder, it has been harder, to get those offers accepted. Now, I would say going forward, you might expect that that will lighten up a little bit. So frankly, I think it's more about just, it's about thinking that a 20% down buyer or a cash buyer is stronger. It's the same kind of bias you would see between a 20% down and an all cash, right? A seller, it's the same money at the end of the day. So, you know, I would, I, I would say there are agents who feel like cash is king. However, 
I would tell my seller, then, you know, take a better offer if this person is really qualified. So as an FHA buyer, one strategy is being willing to pay more yep. than anybody else. And there are ways that you can do that through strategic escalation clauses to win the, the price first. So happy to talk about that offline. Okay, by the way, the FHA, the hesitation to be direct is that if there are any deferred maintenance in the property, that repair has to be done before they approve the FHA loan, either by the buyer or the seller. So that's the reason why there's a hesitation from the seller to take that FHA. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Good points, good points. Okay, we're gonna have one last question, then they'll be around later. Yes, sir, in your name? Uh, my name is Danny. Okay, well, um, I was just going to um, ask about the transaction, uh, the uh, process of negotiation um, for anonymities that should be expected with the property as opposed to just the dwelling itself, like um, in terms of like fixtures or anything of that nature that like, should be expected that you wouldn't necessarily have to. Oh, so I think he's talking about fixtures. Fixtures, what, what would what be considered with a fixture it? that would stay with the property? Yes, yes. Okay. It's like um, I ran into, or well, somebody I know ran into a situation where like a black hole or is it, you know, like they had an argument over a black yeah. hole with fence and curtains and stuff. Yeah, like no that. problems come in when there's a gray area. Is it a fixture or is it not? Stephanie. Oh, 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 you go ahead. <laughs> I mean, first of all, you know, as, as a seller, you know, you, you fill out what is called the TDS, Property Disclosure Statement, where you're going to be listing all the uh, appliances or any belongings that come with the property. Stove, dishwasher, so far, you know. So you look for that document. And keep in mind that everything's negotiable. And you want to negotiate that from the get-go usually. So the the uh, purchase contract has probably 20 boxes you can check with all the the appliances that you want to keep, the washer and dryer, curtain rods, that kind of thing, because that is a gray area at times. And then also um, anything attached to the property, like a light fixture, is automatically included unless stated otherwise. So sometimes we have had sellers that are like emotionally att attached to a chandelier and they want to take it with them. So we before we even put the property on the market in the description, we say chandelier is excluded as an example. But anything, if, if it pertains to furniture, that's usually negotiated in escrow. So if you're at your inspections and you're like, gosh, I really like this sofa, I wonder if they'd be willing to sell it. Those are conversations you can have while you're in escrow, but you typically don't write furniture into an offer. Stephanie? Oh, I was just gonna say, if you want it, Ask for it. Right. We wrote an offer and said, look, we'll take the cat too. So as Meredith had mentioned, the contract actually spells out what a definition of a fixture is, but not everybody seems to interpret it the same. Right. But yeah, so the contract does kind of at least a really good ground groundwork for, uh, for the foundation for what would be considered a fixture, which means it should stay. It technically is what to fix, or if there's a special hole or or attachment, except for a stove. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sorry, uh, a stove, somebody would say, well, a stove is freestanding, it's not a fixture. No, it is. It, it, so. I think that's one of the questions in our real estate um, I think agency <laughs> test. <laughs> 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 confusing questions for those of A pertinent to the yeah, property, right? Pertinent. Something is a fixed, great. Right? Yeah, a fixed. Yeah. A fixed. All right, listen, those were great questions. Thanks so much. I really appreciate them, and uh, hope you walk away from this panel with a better understanding of what you need to do to begin the home ownership process, uh, what to look out for, and what to look out for along the way. I'd like to thank our three panelists, Stephanie Younger, Mary